I'm a physician here in Bismarck. Uh, I trained in internal medicine about 25 years ago. I'm dating myself now. But 25 years ago, I trained in internal medicine. I also did training in critical care. So I'm the doctor that you don't want to wake up and see. Because if you do, that means you're critically ill. But I also do general internal medicine. Now, internal medicine is adult medicine. We basically treat patients 18 years of age and above. And it's a great profession. I'm very lucky and privileged to be in that profession. But 25 years ago, I started thinking, wow, what a vast knowledge or wealth of knowledge we have to have, not just about diseases, but also about medication, <coughs> technology, etc. And you had to learn all of this. And it was really overwhelming but exciting back then. And over these last 25 years, I think back and say to myself, what imagination that people had back 25 years ago and prior to that to bring us to where we are right now. And we really depend on people with imagination to take us into the future. But where are we now and where may we be in the future? So with keeping that in mind, let me share a story with you about one of my patients. And I do have his permission to talk about him. <laughs> and let's just call him John. John is about a 74-year-old gentleman that came in, as we all should, for our annual physical examinations. And during that period of time, part of the time spent with a physician is collecting a past medical history. So I started to talk to John, and I said, John, tell me a little bit about your past history. John said, about 12 years ago, Doc, I had bypass surgery on my heart. I said, well, John, you look pretty doggone good for that. He said, wait a minute, Doc. About five to six years ago after that, I had bypass surgery on my heart a second time. I said, whoa. And you're doing this well? He said, well, wait, wait, Doc. About three years after that, I went back into the cath lab and had two stents placed in my coronary arteries. So, whoa, that's pretty incredible. Now, stents, for those of you that don't understand the medical terminology, they're itsy bitsy little tubes that they put in your coronary arteries. And those are the arteries that preserve or provide flow of blood to your heart muscle. Those are usually obstructed when you have a heart attack. But John had two bypass surgeries and two coronary stents over a process of 12 years. Well, I started to talk to John a little bit more. John said, well, I have some other problems. And I looked through his chart, and I found out John also had diabetes. John also had high blood pressure. John also had high cholesterol. And I thought to myself, whoa, this is kind of a disaster case. But I told John, I said, John, I understand why you had all those heart problems because you have a lot of associated medical problems or health conditions that place you at high risk for that. Recently, where I work here in Bismarck, we have developed a program called Imaginetics, where we can look at your individual genetic makeup to maybe provide information as to what to do. We were in the process of developing these programs, and we were doing sampling of patients at random. When I thought to myself, that John is a perfect patient for this program. So I talked to John and said, John, we have this Imaginetics program where we can check your genetic makeup and maybe predict whether or not you may need a blood thinner down the road, which is commonly used in patients with underlying cardiac disease, a medication that is commonly, commonly known as Plavix. Some of you may already be on it. But Plavix is a medication that prevents a substance in your blood called platelets from sticking together and forming a blood clot. <coughs> blood clots in some cases are good, but in John's situation it may not be. But patients who get coronary stents many times go on Plavix. And I'd like to know whether Plavix is going to work for John or not, because it would be very important for John. He wasn't on it at the time. So I talked to John and said, well, Doc, you know, why not? Let's go do it. It didn't cost anything for him at the time because we were just doing random sampling. So we ran the test, and John was still doing fine. He had a fairly good physical examination, and he went on his way. 
Four months later, John showed up in the emergency room with chest pain, shortness of breath, and it looked like he was having a heart attack. John went to the cath lab where they injected dye into his arteries, and lo and behold, he had almost total occlusion of another coronary artery. Fortunately, the heart doctor, the cardiologist, was able to put another stent in John's coronary artery. Afterwards, the cardiologist goes to the electronic medical record that we have and naturally starts to prescribe Plavix for John. Fortunately, in our electronic medical record, we put together a program where there's an automatic red flag that goes boom, wait, John has a gene that affects Plavix, rendering Plavix ineffective for John. A gene called CYP2C19. Please consider the alternatives, and it lists the two alternatives for John. The cardiologist said, well, okay, I'll prescribe one of these others. John is doing great today. John's circulation to his heart is preserved, and he's leading a normal life. Of course, I got to deal with his diabetes and his hypertension and his hyperlipidemia, but that's secondary. John's life is still here. John is still alive. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what my talk is about today. Pharmacogenetic testing. Checking each individual's genetic makeup, your own DNA, to direct what medications we should use. Why does one medication work for you, but it doesn't work for you? It's the same medication. You both have the same health issue, but why does it work for one individual and not the other? Perhaps it's their genetic makeup. Perhaps it's their own DNA. You know, right now I look around in this room, and there are roughly about 120 people here. But of this 120 people, 26 of you have the same abnormal gene as John. You don't know it. Some of you may already be on Plavix. Some of you may need Plavix in your lifetime. And you don't know you have this gene. By having this gene, if a physician or a provider prescribes Plavix for you, and they don't know you have this gene, and you have a coronary stent, and you go home with aspirin and you go home with Plavix, you have a three-fold increase in clotting off that stent. If you clot off that stent, you interfere with the circulation to the heart muscle, thereby having a potential for a heart attack, and maybe you won't survive. John has thanked me many times, and I thank genetics, and I thank this program for allowing me to do this test before I ever prescribed the medication. In John's case, he's alive, he's doing well. Why? Because we knew his genetic makeup before I ever prescribed this medication. Pharmacogenomics, what is it? Nearly every pathway of drug metabolism, transport, or action is influenced by genetic variation. Many of you have probably heard of the FDA. They control all the drugs and all the prescription medications, saying it's safe and go ahead and use it. But did you know that 131 prescription medications have genomic markers that may affect whether you're writing the right dose, whether you're getting the clinical response that you need? There's so much variability. But 131 medications out there, how often are we doing the genetic testing? That would be my question. So what is a pharmacogenomic test? Do we have to pull out your hair and send a hair sample in? Do we need to cut off some skin and send that in? Do we need to send your liver in and do that? No. Hopefully not. It's a blood test, a simple blood draw. We can map out your whole DNA with one drop of blood. What is a DNA? 
There are 3.2 billion base pairs. Now, base pairs are chemicals that match each other. I think, have you seen sort of that helix, that double helix thing that kind of runs around, that kind of swirls around? You see it in books on biology and ge genetics. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's your DNA. But there's base pairs that get together and they just twist around. There's 3.2 billion of those. And combinations of those base pairs form 25,000 genes. 25,000 genes. Currently, we selected six of those 25,000 genes to study and to check for. Why? How did we do that? Well, we put together a committee. There was about eight to 10 people on this committee. And we looked at the research. You know, you can check for the 25,000 genes, but how many of those have clinical applications? How many of those make a difference? Because I can do this gene, and this gene, and this gene, and this gene, but I have no idea what it does. Or how does it interact with something? So the research that was done, this committee looked at it and said, how many really have clinical applications? Let's select those first and provide the ability for our patients to have those done. Here are some examples. These are the genes and the medications that most clinical data has been shown to support checking for. At the top, you see the CYP2C19. That's the one that affects Plavix in John's case. Below that, you'll see some pain medications, codeine, tramadol. There are genes that affect that metabolism and may cause overdose in dosing, for example, codeine at the traditional dose that were recommended by the FDA, but these patients block one pathway in the liver and speed up the pathway in the other part of the liver, and codeine is changed to morphine by the liver. It's not the codeine that gives you the pain relief. It's the morphine, because it's converted from codeine into morphine. But if you speed up that pathway because you have this abnormal gene, you can overdose a patient very easily, especially pediatric patients. So now they recommend don't prescribe codeine in patients in a, of a pediatric population post-tonsillectomy where they take the tonsils out. But wouldn't it be great if we could predict that so that we don't have to just trial and error a medication and find out that there's adverse side effects from these medications, or they don't work. So what does this mean for patients now? Back 25 years ago, I would prescribe a medication for diabetes, and I expected to work in every patient. Our list of medications we could use back then were, was very limited compared to now. Pharmaceutical companies are making so many medications that it's hard to choose, it's hard to keep up with all that. But wouldn't it be nice to know that this medication will work for you, but it's not gonna work for you and I need to use this medication for you. Same disease, different patient. So rather than one size fits all approach to medicine and prescribing medications for different health issues, now we can use patient directed based on your genetic makeup. This is just the tip of the iceberg in medicine right now. I was excited to be in medicine 25 years ago because of all the advancements. Now that I'm involved with this and I can know perhaps beforehand that this medication is going to work. That is patient direct directed, genetic directed decision making for physicians and providers now. That is an exciting area. We're only testing for six of those genes. There's 25,000 genes out there. How do they work? Wouldn't it be nice in the future, imagine this, in the future, if I could do a blood test, map out someone's DNA, identify what genes this patient has, how many of them are, are abnormal, and say, you know, in 25 years, you're probably going to develop cancer. But I know what to use for you. Or, better yet, 
I know what your genetic makeup is, and I can turn off that gene. So you never develop cancer. Or I can turn off this gene and never, never develop diabetes. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Patients don't have to worry about the complications of diabetes, the blindness, the kidney disease, the multiple amputations. Why? Because we know their genetic makeup. We know what will work, what won't work, and maybe someday we can turn off those genes. Right now, we have a program available to do something pretty incredible. Not just looking at certain genes right now, but wouldn't it be nice to be able to predict and pass something on to family? I mean, look at, well, look at all the younger individuals in the audience right now. Wow. Great minds, or you wouldn't be here. Inquisitive minds, or you wouldn't be here. And imagination. Don't turn off your imagination gene. Stimulate it. Get it going. Contribute something to perhaps learning something, at least in the medical field, that can prevent disease and provide comfort to our patients and to our friends. I'd like to leave you with one last thought. Never ask permission to leave a legacy. What a great legacy that you can do. Provide a sample of blood, and we can put it in a biobank. They can map out your genes, map out your DNA, so that years from now, when we're all dead and gone, they can track it to your great, great, great grandchild and say, you know, you have this gene that places you at risk for developing diabetes. You have this gene that places you at risk for developing cancer. But we have a technology to turn off that gene now. So you never have to deal with that. Imagine that. Consider leaving a legacy. You don't have to ask permission. Thank you.